Hi, Peter. Julian, how are you? I'm doing all right. I'm doing all right. How are you doing? Uh, it is another great day here in New Haven, Connecticut, as sure as I'm sure it is out in Los Angeles, where my uh, partner in crime is located. You know, it is very un Los Angeles today. I'm extremely uh, dissatisfied with. I'm in a turtleneck, and that's probably like the only way that I'm getting through <laughs> this. That's like my only thing that I like about cooler weather, but it's overcast and everything. How you doing, Sri? I decided to stay in true Los Angeles gear, decided to be the CPG guy, and I have my t-shirt on. Yeah, nice. Uh, so sorry York, about the Coming from New York, Julian, when it drops below 32, we'll talk about the weather. Otherwise, we're in good shape. Yeah, uh, true blue Angelino here, so I'm relying on me to complain about it. But um, so sorry about the technical issues. I know that we're getting started a little bit late, but we'll be all right, I'm sure. Uh, the CPG guys. So uh, folks, if you haven't been watching this podcast, following along, they are, they're really a byword on the CPG and e-commerce scene. You really need to check them out. These two gentlemen, and I'll let them explain themselves because I'm not sure what's okay for me to say and what's not, uh, because they have really illustrious jobs. Uh, but uh, suffice to say, they, uh, they know because they're in it. They're in it real deep. They've been in it for a long time. They've got different specialties, but there are both, uh, both sets of specialties that each of them possess, highly in demand, highly in, uh, at the top of uh, mind for executives in e-commerce, D2C, CPG, new retail, antiquated retail, the whole shebang. So uh, they have, um, they've hosted, you know, folks from Coca-Cola, Mondelez, uh, Mondelez, <laughs> Pepsi, uh, Johnson & Johnson, Walmart, Instacart, Wish.com, and, uh, and they do it at the peer level. So gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having us, Julian. Thank you, Julian. Yeah. So uh, I hope this is the first of many, but let's kick it off. Uh, the question that I've got, and I'm sure that everybody watching here is, is burning curious too. Uh, what is actually new right now? Uh, and why is CPG on the path that it's on this late in, in its evolution? Like what's, what's new in general and what's new for CPG? Why do you, why do you kick us off with that, Sri? So, you know, Julian, I, I want to jump into the global supply chain crisis, inflation, things of that nature, but those have already been discussed. I'm going to get a little tactical here and kind of jump to two things that have changed how we in CPG and retail land look at the consumer, which I think matter the most and go forward will actually be a divergent point for how we operate. So number one is consumer attention. If you thought about how the industry shaped itself over the last 100 plus years, maybe 150 years, consumer attention was garnered for brand equity development largely through offline mechanisms, radio, print, TV. Eventually, Google came on. You know, one by one, online platforms started coming on. YouTube TV came on, things of that nature. The biggest change today is I think the entire industry understands that go forward during the pandemic, with the rate of adoption of streaming media, as well as digital convenience tools, attention, aka brand equity development, aka advertising is largely shifted to be almost, I wanna say almost exclusively digital, which is a big deal because the CPG industry was kind of last in terms of digital adoption, almost last if not last. And uh, whereas if you compare with banking, which is one of the earliest ones, toys was one of the earliest ones, electronics. In, in the industry Peter and I come from, a lot of what y'all take for granted every day in other industries is still relatively new, like ratings and reviews is a great example. We're still building those things. The need to have digital content, we're building those things. But to me, I summarize all of it. The greatest power force that is changing our industry is digital consumption and digital consumption of media as well as consumer attention, therefore being largely digital. And even within that, if I were to draw, take a microscope and dissect, it's what I would call the attention is moving to retail. Attention on retail platforms. This could be x.com, y.com, z.com. You put retailers, X, Y, Z, you pick the retailer and put them in. 
in, in the UK, that could be Tesco, somewhere else it could be Alibaba, it really doesn't matter. In the US, we have our own plethora of retailers. So imagine, Julian, when attention shifts from platforms into retail.com, you got a whole new set of media services, et cetera, being born, a whole way how a marketing mix is done, being born from scratch, how people think about these things. And the second one that goes hand in hand with that, and I'll stop at that is, obviously, if atten consumer attention is changing, for the first time in our industry, a brand can actually be a full funnel marketer and not just a top of funnel marketer and offline mechanisms only. A brand can actually drive attention all the way to conversion, which I think is a big deal. And hence the word e-commerce, which again is over 10 years old, 15 years old in some industry, still relatively new in CPG. The rate of adoption by the consumer of e-commerce for fast moving consumer goods in the last 18 months has crossed the inflection point. Generally, I would put that inflection point at about 20% of overall selling opportunity. And we're there at CPG, that inflection moment has arrived. So those two words, I would say, consumer attention and media and e-commerce are the two hottest nows in the industry. And obviously needless to say, I'm sure Julian, we're gonna get into what are all the capabilities that are born as a result of that, where people need to muscle up, but to me, those two forces alone are game changers. Interesting. What do you What do you think, Peter? What are you seeing? From From my perspective, what is going on in terms of the evolution is just the fact that the digital shelf is so critically important, and people need to win the digital shelf, and the rules are radically different than what you're seeing on the physical shelf in the terrestrial world. So in the old days, you focused on things like uh, brand blocking and displays and assortment, and on the digital shelf, every item lives and dies on its own. So you need to make sure that, uh, that your products can exist of their own merits and not simply because they're part of a larger brand portfolio. Here's a quote I want to put out, Julian. There's a quote I want to put out from one of our friends that came on the a podcast from Profit Arrow, where they talked about you know winning this war for attention in the corresponding digital shelf Peter referred to. If you don't show up on the first page, you might as well treat it like a dead body in a graveyard on the second, third, fourth pages because your product is never going to win the war for attention. Yeah, I'll, so, I'll, go ahead. Oh, Peter, go ahead, please. I'll just build on that. The, the data that we've seen says that 80% of shoppers never go beyond that first page. So as Shri said, if you are not winning search, you're not appearing on the first page, you're really not in the consideration set, which, which begs the question of what are the capabilities that brands need to be focused on and investing against to win that. And there's a there's an acronym that was coined by Shri and his team at J&J &J during his tenure there, and it's called Scanner. And I, I, I really like it because I think it encapsulates the core capabilities that brands need to focus on. The S stands simply for search, and that really responds to, or refers rather to paid search or sponsored search. That's retail media, right? That's how you get on the very top line of search results. Now, that indicates that you have budget to do exactly that. At some point, you can't have budget or even room to sponsor uh, every item in your portfolio. So then you have to think about more organic search. And that's when you start focusing on things like content. Does the description of your product have the keywords that are typically used in search for the category that your product's competing on? Do you have the right copy in the body of the product page? Do you have enough images on your product page? Uh, and then you have to start thinking about, okay, now what's the assortment that I'm going to have? You have to realize that you don't. You shouldn't really be focused on having exactly the same assortment across all your different retail outlets in the omni-channel world. This is really about developing price pack and price promo architecture so that you have different solutions that are relevant to different retailers and it allows you to help them differentiate themselves. 
Uh, you want to make sure that navigation is as frictionless as possible, both from a UX experience on your site. And as a category captain, you should be guiding your retailers on what the UX should be like on their site. So you're going to bring that expertise as, as understanding your category better than they understand your category. And you should be advocating to make sure that their, their on-site search capabilities are taking into account what you think is important for your category. Uh, and that, that's really the, the navigation. And then lastly, R, which is, as Sri referenced earlier, ratings and reviews. Profitero tells us there are five key attributes that drive search results and are highly associated with positive search results on sites like walmart.com. And, and that really comes down to the keywords in the title, the images on your site, the copy in your body on product pages, but also the average star rating and the review count that you have. So if you're not invested in making sure that your products have a copious amount of social proof, which is validation from other shoppers who bought that product that, hey, that's a really great product and it addresses the needs that I have, then your product isn't going to appear on the first page of search results. So if you're not thinking about investing against that, in fact, it's gotten to a point now where quite a number of retailers like Walmart and Target not only are telling brands that they need to be getting content onto their site, but they'll actually financially penalize that. They have content scorecards. And that means that on a quarterly basis, they will get levied chargebacks for not having achieved a minimum number of reviews or an average star rating or have recency of reviews. That's all very important. They understand that it impacts how people shop their sites. So the, the, the scanner component, but the other thing I think that's really important from a capabilities perspective is just the data that you use to make these decisions. Increasingly having first party consumption data is the coin of the realm. It certainly helps you when you negotiate with big omni-channel retailers around innovation. If you wanna get your product listed and you don't wanna be paying exorbitant slotting fees, you wanna be able to demonstrate that your product has merit for being on their digital shelf, you better have first party data. I know Shri will tell you that he says, in this day and age for a brand, particularly one that's looking to scale, direct to consumer is non-negotiable for many reasons, most notably, because you want that first party data to really understand how consumers are buying your product, what they're saying about it. That's gonna help you with your innovation. So you need to build a strategy to figure out how you're going to get your hands on first party data because most of the big retailers aren't sharing their first party data from their walled gardens. So if you don't have that, if you're not either doing direct to consumer yourself, you have hybrid solutions or where you're working with third parties who enable that connectivity, uh, or you're procuring it from another third party that has all of that purchase data, you know, you're going to be at a disadvantage against your competitors in this category. So first party data strategy, very, very important to empower everything else we've been talking about. Some key points for the audience who've been watching since yesterday, that theme of getting out and talking to people about your needs uh, when you thought, you know, there, there's a lot of reasons why people don't think, oh, I should get on a plane and talk to my people in Southeast Asia or wherever. Uh, I need to, you know, check out how they feel about sustainability. You know, making sure that your category and, and how you're featured on these platforms domestically, if it's, if it's important here, <laughs> And it, it certainly sounds like it. Imagine how important that is in a foreign context with foreign platforms. Uh, you know, to make that link, you know, in every single space that we talked about this stuff yesterday, that comes up as a ma major theme. Um, and and first party data, that it, it just seems like that is that is coming up everywhere. Uh, that that uh, you know whether that's you know, I know that we'll get into some some issues around that in a, in a moment here, but you don't have that the data, uh, especially with all these platform policies and regulations that are coming down the line and, and have already been uh, sort of swirling around for several years. Major, major disadvantages if you don't get that process started soon. Um, so scanner is helpful, folks. Uh, I think if anyone wants me to, I'll send out more about that later. 
Um, so what is sticky? What's what's here to stay? So we had a bunch of things emerge. You know, we had we had like older populations that people had all kinds of assumptions about with boomers and so on, not being able to do e-commerce. That this turned out to be entirely false. They eventually found someone to help them figure it out, or they knew it all along, and we were just underestimating them. Um, and uh, I say that as a proud avant-garde member of the millennial generation. <laughs> um, I've taught a lot of people how to make PDFs, but uh, so, but older folks, they got it in ways that people, and, and not just like the obvious things, but like, you know, online to offline ideas uh, that are fairly new, uh, the live shopping stuff, um, a lot of things like this. So there, there's that kind of thing. You know, what else are you seeing, Sri, uh, that is here to stay, we found out a lot. This means that there are new possibilities. These are trends that are alive and well, and now and we, now we've got the opportunity to strike. What do you see? Julian, I want to go back to your platform comment and then we'll come into what's sticky. And we'll sure. address the question of the boomer population, et cetera, uh, using online. But back to your comment about platforms, no two platforms are born the same. You know, the consumer may overlap from platform to platform and may shop on multiple platforms, but it's important to understand coming from a consumer industry, what Peter and I will tell you that when they go to different platforms, they have a different need state why to go, why they go to a different platform. One might be convenience and immediacy of fulfillment. Another one may be they may be shopping based on price and value. Another one may be they're shopping for loyalty points. Another one might be a completely needs, completely different need state, has nothing to do with any of those because they're bundling and packaging and they find the greatest assortment there and they're not as price sensitive. So it's completely different set of nude states. You can't answer the consumer's needs very homogeneous and vanilla across all platforms. That's why that state statement of yours was so important. Now multiply that by different countries, it's exponential. Now let me get back to your question, what's sticky, the boomer population, et cetera. You know, earlier, Julian, I said, largely CPG was slow to adopt e-commerce and digital. There was a reason for that. And retail did the same because there was a reason for retail as well. The purchasing power of this country, largely I read a Wall Street Journal just yesterday, it was in yesterday's Wall Street Journal. So that's the 2nd of December. Largely the purchasing power of this country still sits in the baby boomer generation. That's the reality, whether we want to accept it or not, it's over 50%. It used to be closer to 70. Last 10 years, it's declined to just about 50 plus, but it's still 50 plus. If the purchasing power sits with a generation that is not using the actual capabilities of digital or finds the need to use digital or uses dig digital in any meaningful way, there's no point building a whole bunch of capabilities for a, uh, a group where the purchasing power is lower. What changed in COVID and is going to be sticky is that group of folks, that cohort, actually started adopting digital for the first time when they realized through, I would say what was necessitated and forced largely by the pandemic that convenience-based shopping, digital is about the easiest you can do. And even from a price value perspective, if you adopt digital, you are gonna be price value advantaged as well. And, and with the advancement of click and collect and pick up services from a multitude of retailers, you know, Europe is where this really took off in a big way. China has it and now it's taking off in a significant way in the United States. For, for, for that generation, the ability to shop online, save significant time, and then go to the store just for a pickup, have it put in the trunk of the car, et cetera, is a big deal. So if you ask me one of the most stickiest trends in fast moving consumer goods, number one, now that the, uh, from an age perspective, all segments of the population and the largest part of the household wallet has adopted digital and e-commerce, Digital and e-commerce is here to stay. So anyone in FMCG land, if you're thinking, oh my gosh, is this something I should follow? Do I need to double down, triple down? The answer is pretty straightforward in front of your face, actually. The answer is yes. You also don't have a choice. You need to go 800 miles an hour because that's the speed it's moving. The second thing is, how will this shape itself out? Is home delivery, I think of fulfillment. Which parts of fulfillment are the most most, the, the ones that are going to be most stickiest in our industry, which generally is fast moving and tends to have lower average retail price. Click and collect is going to emerge, especially food and beverages, ring uh, price rings below $15 average unit price. 
uh, click and collect is going to emerge as a significant e-commerce opportunity across the board. You know, buy online, you drive to a pickup location, either you walk in store or you um, end up getting it loaded into your car. That in-store component is also very important for a retailer because as consumers come and pick up in their car, they want to bring them in store so that they can also drive the impulse location. I don't want to say just drive, but also satisfy a consumer's needs there. And it solves for some of the impossibilities or inconveniences of being not on the first page, right? Absolutely. So that's how you, that's how you fix well that said. thing. Very yeah. well said, Julian. Indeed, you know, what, what a great statement, right? Like if most of the impulse items are rarely going to make themselves to the first page. So the best way for a consumer to actually pay attention to them is when you get that order fulfilled and you pick it up in store in one shop, you're going to still find what I lovingly call department 82, which is impulse across the board. So what about, what about the social commerce landscape? So we've got yeah. live shopping, of course, which is going to get a lot of attention today, but also, uh, you know, influencers, is this a thing yeah. with CPG? Uh, yeah. What's going on with other forms of social commerce that uh, I know that folks from, you know, other disciplines know a lot about some of them, these things are new here in general, but What's going on yeah. with all that stuff? I think another miss overall by the industry is TikTok. TikTok is garnering human attention in ways that I cannot even come up with words for. And the speed of adoption of TikTok is insane. Those who say TikTok is really for the 15 to 25 years, Gen Z, just take two minutes, log in, create a profile and check out who's actually posting on TikTok. And it's across the board from an age spectrum, demographic, men, women, you know, a generational genders, crosses multiple genders, call it what you may. Them, they, everybody's on TikTok. And, and once people get on TikTok, they stay there for hours at a time. And again, Wall Street Journal article from yesterday, TikTok is the number one downloaded platform in the last uh, month, uh, globally. So the attention is moving to TikTok number one. TikTok is here to stay, it's sticky and, and, and uh, I remember doing a podcast with um, Vincent Yang from Firework Media about three months ago where we talked about video shopping. If you think about enabling video shopping in the moment, and I talked about earlier the full funnel for a marketer, TikTok video shopping with folks like Firework Media, think about it for a second, Julian. Um, that capability they're building, what a big deal it is because you go from top of funnel to bottom of funnel in a 30-second clip. I can't think of a faster way to drive up and down the funnel than a 30 second clip. So video shopping is the next one. Um, but how do you drive video shopping? It's you use the word influencer, right? That's another one. I think the industry, our industry is still adopting and learning influencers. It's very important to understand that influencer will, the word simply influencer is not the word we're looking for. It's contextual influencers. So for example, if you're selling a beverage, it's somebody in from the space of food and beverage, perhaps those curated chefs that are actually building recipes and are using beverages in some capacity. So you wanna pick up, if it's a world of fashion, obviously you wanna pick people from that field. Contextual influencers with video shopping is a sticky trend. You heard it here today, folks, it's here to stay. It's going to build. It needs to be a part of your marketing mix. Does that help, Julian? Oh, absolutely. And, and 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 folks, we usually have something on influencers. I decided not to do it this time. Uh, it, we're going to come back. There's so much going on with influencers right now. I mean, I've heard the story many times from Impossible, but I did a special project last month. Like the whole reason why that started was that a, a super elite chef, you know, brought them in and they said, you know what, this is going to change the world. I'm in, and uh, that was their influencer. Right, and this is before TikTok arrived on the scene. I mean, I don't use TikTok, but they are damn good at finding whatever it is that you seem to be interested in and shooting it straight in front of you, no matter how many people have watched it. They just, there's something about that platform, they just know these things. And, um, and then of course, keeping them on your own site, you know, the theme of decentralization is a big one that came up yesterday. Uh, and you know we see this with Shopify, we see this with you know crypto bros, right? So this idea of of something not being controlled by, by one platform or one government or something like that, there's something innately meta thematically appealing about it. But when you know you're you know a brand, you don't want to be giving all that data to 
uh, Amazon so they could just take all the data and start it up on their own brand and you're you're on page two and, <laughs> and out of luck, you know? Uh, so, you know, Shopify is part of that trend. And then uh, we're going to be talking with Firework in a second here about live shopping in China and what's going on here and in other parts of the world. But um, yeah, so, so and, and then contextual influencers, that seems to be the thing because I've, I, I see this mistake come up all the time with American companies. They think that they need something polished. They look at the beauty influencers. They look at the, um, you know, bikini influencers on, on Instagram, all the thirst traps. And they think, well, shoot, we've got to have like really high production value and make our product as thirst trappable. <laughs> you know, they need something really glossy. And, and it's all about the authenticity. Just so I mean, purely contextual, Julian. I mean, pick influencers yeah. from the industry that you are actually trying to discuss a product in. Totally. And it doesn't need to be high gloss. You know, if it's a butcher shop, you go into the butcher shop and you get the butcher talking about what they love and they're excited about. Yeah. Um, now, Julian, just think you mentioned high glass, right? Think about how these contextual influencers are doing video shopping based outcomes. They're picking up the iPhone, they're, they're using the selfie on the camera, and they're running a 30 second live stream video. There's nothing high glass or a fancy photo shoot. Yeah, they may have a ring light in front of them. But, but you know, gone are the days of you need to do these $50,000 video shoots over 30 minutes. I mean, we talked about changing forces in the industry. Man, this one is going to really hit the industry hard and bring about change, not only from that perspective, but imagine that same $500,000 shoot now, you could do 10 of these for the same expense. And again, for some reason, Wall Street Journal yesterday, December 2nd, a ton of this data. Um, and, and the ROAS on contextual influencer TikTok video shopping is 6-6. Six, six. I can't think of many platforms that deliver a six is to one ratio for ad spend. That is, uh, that's, that's interesting. So what do you think the effect of that will be? I've got a follow-up question in just a moment here, but, uh, and, and then I think we got to turn over to Rick. He's not here yet. So that's making me suspicious, but uh, what do you think, what do you, what do you think that will mean for folks? How do think you think that's the, likely to play out with say, CPG? Yeah. Shifting nature of ROAS, right? I mean, I, I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing modern marketing mixes across the industry being adopted. That I think is the single biggest thing. And then on retail platforms, how video shopping is actually gonna show up in the near future. And when I say near future, I'm not talking a three year journey like we traditionally do. I'm talking next six to 12 months. Okay. Now, uh, Peter, I'm curious about, you know, one thing that seems to be coming up more and more, and it's a term that we've been hearing for years, and it's something that you, uh, Sri and I were talking about recently. Uh, folks know that user-generated content is extremely important. We talked about ratings and reviews, uh, but one thing that <clears throat> I see in a lot of places is this move from, uh, move from, okay, we're a brand, we need to get our social media act together. Okay, we're a brand, we need to start producing content. Okay, we're a brand. Now we're a media house because folks want us to be their friend and aspirational and get into their lives. And we want users in that mix. Uh, so the, the content production side, we've, we're a media house. And then the user side, where they're making the content with these folks, uh, what do you see in that space? What's interesting to you? It's pretty hard to do a couple of swipes up through Instagram without coming across an advertisement that contains on it at the top of the page, uh, five graphic stars and a verbatim talking about how great the product is. That's user generated content. Why is it appearing? Because it works. It really actually drives purchase acceleration. Here's a great example of a retailer that figured this out. They saw some research that said that the single biggest driver of conversion from national brands to private label, it's not the price. Price is built into the private label equation. It's actually the quality. And nothing addresses quality quicker than feedback from other consumers who've actually purchased the product and tried it. So this retailer went about using its frequent shopper data and its order feed 
to be able to solicit user-generated content exclusively for its private label items. Uh, in, in the matter of about two months, it collected almost 500,000 pieces of content and started populating that on all of their product pages. Well, what happened as a result of that? Those items all started getting badged as having been top rated. They appeared at the top of search results, not because they were being featured or advertised, but because consumers had trust. What was the net effect? Everything else held constant. They saw nearly a 60% increase in e-commerce sales coming from their private labels simply because they added user-generated content. How do we know it works? We know it works from our friends out in Seattle. You walked into an Amazon Fresh store, noticed the digital shelf tags. What do they have on every digital shelf tag? An average star rating and a review count. Why did they do that? A couple of years ago, they introduced a store in Manhattan that's now in a couple of other locations. It's called their four-star store. We were talking with one of our guests and he said, I don't really understand what that store is about. The category selection makes absolutely no sense. And, and my response is the purpose of the store was not to try and address or be any particular type of format. It was to try and prove that in a physical world, what they were doing in the digital world around using their secret sauce, which is all of that UGC to drive purchase consumption would actually work. So you walk into that four-star store in lower Manhattan and you see digital shelf tags with all of those average star rating and review count. That is the signal to consumers that other people have tried this and they like it. How do we know it worked? Well, six months later, they retrofitted all of their physical bookstores with that capability. They're putting it in the Amazon Go stores. So Amazon knows that UGC works. This retailer that used UGC to drive their e-commerce sales, they know it worked. What are they doing now? They're doing what Amazon did. They're starting to promote on their physical shelves the fact that their private label are highly trusted by consumers. So we get back to that influencer. The influencer doesn't have to create a video. Just writing a simple review and giving it a star rating in aggregate among a lot of users is enough to drive acceleration of purchase. And as I said, repurposing that content so it doesn't just sit in that section of the product page where ratings and reviews typically sit, bringing it out, letting it see the light of day, putting it on Instagram posts also can help accelerate and get people to start buying your product. So UGC, if you're not, if you're a brand and you are not strategically invested in how you are collecting and allocating and repurposing UGC. I mean, there, you know, L'Oreal probably spends north of $10 million a year just collecting user-generated content to drive its brands. This is really critical also in the, this, what you said points to a, a bunch of themes that have come up and, and something that we're going to be talking about with uh, Ted Rogers from Digital River, which is that it's important here. It's also important there. If you go in, into foreign uh, locations, if you're not getting it in the local uh, languages, local ratings, really localizing your content and your, your UGC in that regard, you're really running at a deficit. And, um, uh, and it also points to something that has both, uh, it's an interesting development, this lack of trust, right? Everybody's advertises so good. Everybody says that they're the best. Who can I trust? It's just a lot of the wisdom of trust. That goes in the other, in darker ways with people on YouTube ending up in you know rabbit holes and then invading the capital. Um, but so <laughs> there is often stupidity of crowds, but, um, but the wisdom of crowds is, is something that I think people count on when it comes to products. Uh, and finally, you know, there were a few other things, but we got to wrap up. The last thing that I want to ask you guys is your e each of you, like the number one thing that uh, you see in 2022 and beyond in this new landscape, all these changes have come up, all the things that we know now, what's your number one thing that you think people should be thinking about for the next year at, for strategic reasons looking out into the bigger future? Number one is if you're in the FMCG world or in retail, you can't ignore digital. You can't, you, your marketing media mix is the number one thing that comes to my head. 
based on everything we've discussed today, I mean, based on the rest of this conference and what you'll probably hear, balance of day, it, the, the, all of this, if you put it in a blender and shook it up, it comes down to the war for human attention. And, and streaming media, digital media, as well as digital mechanisms for shopping, browsing, innovation discovery is the future of our industry in, in consumer packaged goods, consumer goods. I know the previous speaker referred to CPG as well. And, and if you aren't modernizing your marketing mix with a heavy lean on digital, it's a miss that's actually going to stunt brand growth or brand equity development or even sustaining brand equity for a long time to come. So folks, open up that, open up that door, go back into the marketing mix and truly look to modernize it. You know, I'm shortchanging that Julian by only referring to digital behind that is a ton of data forces like 1P, the forces of the causals of how people buy, how consumers buy product. You know, Peter referred to UGC being a piece of it. You can't ignore these things anymore. Your digital competency, which still is, it was, was largely behind in the industry in the last 18 months. Consumer goods and retail is really muscle, muscling up. I would couple talent development with it. I was just about to say, we, we talked about this the other day. Uh, you know, what does this mean for talent? What does this mean for the current pipeline of CEOs in the future? You brought it up. Absolutely sage wisdom that folks need to be thinking about right now. A lot of winners and losers going to be decided at some legacy brands over that. Uh, Peter, we, we've really got to wrap up, but what's, yeah. what's your number one? Couple one, what Shri said, the way you're going to make digital work for you is still recognize that the vast majority of sales are occurring in the terrestrial world. 85% of food and beverage at, 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 or even more is still happening in physical stores. So how do you connect the digital to the physical world? You got to start availing yourselves of capabilities like QR codes. I know we've heard QR codes on and on again, but honestly, if you're not putting QR codes on your most important real estate as a brand, your packages, to enable consumers to engage with you, to share feedback like UGC, to learn more about your product and make that digital investment that Sri talks about seeing, you're kind of missing the boat. If you don't help enable that connection, you're not going to maximize the investment you put against it. Thank you so much, gentlemen. I really appreciate this. Uh, you I bet that we could uh, end up doing some much longer stuff around all this, these things because the implications for what you're talking about domestically is a global thing. Folks are trying to figure this out. I know they are. Um, uh, it's certainly relevant here because it's everybody's biggest market uh, in, in many things. So uh, let's not make this the first time, the, the last time. Uh, we'll, we'll do something again, yeah? Absolutely, Julian. Thank, Thank you, you Julian. for having Thank us. Thank you for having us, CPG guys. Okay, thanks for thanks oh, for being I'll here. Just I'll say, to everyone, soon. go to cpgguys.com. We're on over 40 platforms. Subscribe to our podcast or go to LinkedIn and just search CPG Guys and follow our page. Yes, do that. Thank All you. right, guys. Thank you. Rick.